The crypto space has been attracting millions and millions of people over the past couple of months, with projects doing over thousands and thousand percents of gains in a matter of weeks and sometimes even just days. However, with all this money being made, there's always someone on the losing end, and that's going to be mostly the general consumer. And certain government agencies, much like the SEC, don't take too kindly to that. And because of this, a lot of projects in this space, some that aren't even really booming in price that much, are actually being sued by the SEC, some for securities fraud, some for just not letting customers know, you know, what's even going on. And from the way things are looking, it really just seems like the SEC is doing what they can to bar people as much as possible to even get access to cryptocurrencies, both in New York and in the United States. So today, we're going to kind of take a look at the SEC, uh, who they are, why they came about, as well as what their role is, or maybe even should be, up within the crypto space. This is going to be a little bit of a long video, but I promise you it'll be interesting. Grab some popcorn, sit back in your chair, kick back and relax. We're going to get into it now. We're going to go ahead and take a trip all the way back to the 1920s in the United States. People were hoping to become millionaires off the stock market that at the time uh, was booming, or really kind of going to the moon, as we say. The ordinary Joe decided it'd be a good idea to mortgage his home and invest said money into the stock market. You know, use the everyday money that they needed to throw in, hoping to make a quick buck tomorrow. And mind you, when I say everyday Joe, I mean quite a good amount of just regular people were getting involved in stocks. However, it wasn't the involvement that you would think. It was really just these people, you know, buying stocks on margin, borrowing the money from the banks, uh, and hoping to make a heap more before they had to pay it back uh, with interest. So these are people that were getting into the stock market, uh, pretty much like maybe you and I, that may or may not have no experience at all with risk management, how to handle your money, as well as just the stocks to buy. But not only that, you did also have financial institutions coming in and pretty much telling people, hey, you know what, this is a great security to buy, this is a great stock to buy, and in all reality, it was probably shit. Uh, so unfortunately, people were kind of throwing all their money, throwing all the life savings into stuff like this, and really had no idea what they were doing. Interestingly enough, something called blue sky laws were already in place to protect those ordinary people from dumping their life savings into worthless securities that were being backed by crappy companies and pumped by a bunch of bozo promoters. Sounds familiar, right? Previously, investing was only believed to be for the wealthy, and it was thought that they could only handle such risk because they already had a lot of money. Sound familiar? Accredited investors? So it was assumed that they know how to manage their wealth and risk more so than that average Joe. And again, reminds me a lot of just accredited investors in general. That's kind of really how it is over here in the States, how you, if you make a certain amount of money and you have a certain income, then usually that's when you're considered for more higher risk, higher reward opportunities giving the rich a better chance to get richer, and the poor not even a chance at all. But nonetheless, based on this assumption, one can say that people who had less money weren't to be trusted in the stock market because of how fast one can gain and lose depending on that investment. This is something that will be very important later on, so keep it in mind. This stock market boom, along with a myriad of other things, caused the Great Depression to begin in 1929 starting with the stock market crash, and lasted about 10 years. To this day, the Great Depression is considered to be one of the worst economic crashes of the 20th century, and I'd probably argue of our lifetimes, <laughs> resulting in the S&P 500 to drop 85% from its previous high, as well as leaving 25% of the American population unemployed at its peak. So yeah, I mean, you know, it was pretty bad, it was pretty bad. However, because of this, numerous events uh, and laws were actually created that would end up changing regulation within the financial industry forever. Because, to be honest with you, it's pretty obvious that the blue sky laws really weren't being enforced at all, and they really just didn't work. And this was obvious because in 1932, three years after the Great Depression started, uh, the PCORA hearings were held by the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, and they found that many financial institutions conducted insider trading as well as lied to investors about which securities were popular back then. Imagine you going to Chase Bank or one of these other different banks and asking them, hey, what are some good stocks to buy? And them telling you, hey, you know, the, the stock just came out the other day, and they're selling wrist rests that look like pigs. This is going to be the next great investment, Tommy. Trust me, throw in a million dollars, you'll be great. <laughs> the unfortunate part is that these financial institutions had a vested interest to lie to people because they'd make more money at the end of the day by selling these crappy securities, unfortunately. So just a year later, the Securities Act of 1933 was created and required registration of most security sales within the U.S., along with making sure the financial institutions gave the investor the truth and important information about said company. Pretty much, this law enforced these financial institutions to do the right thing and give the consumer all of the information needed to make an educated decision on whether to buy a security or not. And this is something that I am 
all for it. I mean, you know, these financial institutions or, you know, whatever it is, brokers or what have you, they should be held accountable to tell people the truth. I mean, if I'm investing into something, if I'm investing into a pig-related wrist, wrist, uh, wrist company, I want to know the details. How are the pigs being made? Are they actual pigs? Where's the... <laughs> you know what I mean? I just want the truth, okay? Just give me the truth, nothing but the truth. <laughs> then finally, just a year later, on June 6th, 1934, the Securities Exchange Act was signed, and the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, was birthed giving them the ability to regulate the entire industry surrounding securities, as well as being able to file lawsuits against companies or individuals who violated said laws. Now we're talking about the SEC. Now, in terms of the SEC and their mission, they really have a three-part you know, purpose or mission. Number one, to protect investors. Uh, and this can be both from lying institutions, making sure, obviously, that the institutions are saying the right things, as well as protecting them from themselves, potentially. Um, obviously, the <laughs> the period before the Great Depression pretty much showed the SEC and, I guess, a lot of people that the average Joe uh, doesn't really know how to manage their wealth too well. So the SEC, of course, wants to make sure that the average consumer isn't spending more than they're willing to lose, I guess. The second is to facilitate capital formation. Uh, this is kind of just a fancy way of saying to help people raise money, uh, whether it be for business or individual reasons. As well as number three, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets. Uh, I think the main thing here, though, to take away is number one, to protect investors. Uh, that's kind of the main thing that the SEC wants to do. Um, and yeah, I mean, because it's, it's kind of clear that the SEC first came about uh, because they want to do right by the average citizen. They want to make sure that the individual person was given all the correct information about a security before investing, keeping financial institutions uh, at bay by holding them accountable for their actions, and making sure there was no insider trading of the sort. So yeah, I mean, I would argue that the SEC was made for a legitimate reason, uh, and they had good intentions behind making it. At the end of the day, they just wanted to make sure the average citizen was good. But with all this stuff being said, I should make sure to explain what a security really is at uh, low level, uh, because to be honest with you, securities aren't as obvious as they seem. I mean, obviously, if it was easy to define a security, then frankly, we wouldn't be having this huge issue right now in the crypto space. But a security, in a nutshell, is a fungible asset that can be traded as well as hold some type of monetary value. This is, again, the simplest way for me to put it because the SEC has quite a broad definition of what a security can be and is why there are so many lawsuits uh, within the crypto space about certain cryptocurrencies being considered securities. However, something happened in 1946 that would have forever change the way securities were actually interpreted by the U.S. And this is going to be the case between the SEC versus W.J. Howey. And don't worry, we're not going to get into the actual uh, Howey test case in here in general. We're really just going to touch on the outcome of the case, which is going to be the Howey test. And it pretty much stated that something can be considered a security or an investment contract if, number one, there is an investment of money. Number two, if that investment is in a common enterprise. Number three, if there is an expectation of profit by the consumer. And number four, if this profit is derived from the efforts of others. This is one of the blueprints used by the SEC in determining whether a project can be considered a security or not. There have been many projects that have fallen under this rubric, uh, according to the SEC, and were sued because of it. There are also some projects out there that are trying to design themselves to avoid being considered one as well. But nonetheless, now that we know what the SEC is, how they came about, and how they generally judge crypto projects, let's go ahead and take a couple of looks at some of the most notable lawsuits uh, and just cases that are being conducted by the SEC currently. The SEC has been after anything related to uh, initial coin offerings or ICOs, as well as digital assets, crypto in general, uh, for quite some time. And just to be clear, an ICO is kind of like an IPO. You know, when a company comes out with a stock and they, they uh, distribute it to the people, uh, it's the same thing. People, or projects in this case, go ahead and start their project, they release their tokens or coins uh, for a certain amount of money, the people give them the money, and the project gives them the coins. Simple transaction. And obviously the issue is that this can be considered a sales of securities according to the SEC. However, the SEC and its involvement within the crypto space dates back all the way back to uh, 2013. Uh, and they've hit multiple companies since then. Uh, companies, obviously, individuals, and even autonomous organizations. Yeah. The DAO is going to be the first one that we're going to talk about. Now, for those who don't know what the DAO is, the DAO essentially stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization and is pretty much just a group of smart contracts that exist on the Ethereum blockchain. It was a way for rules and governance to exist in code rather than needing a group of individuals to make decisions. Mind you, this lawsuit was issued back in 2017, but it's very important for us to talk about because of a very important outcome. But let's go ahead and get into it. So why did the SEC investigate the DAO? 
Well, essentially, they had a pre-sale, uh, the DAO in this case, where you were able to send Ether to a smart contract, uh, again, which is a cryptocurrency, and in return, you would get DAO tokens. And according to the SEC, they found that the tokens offered and sold by a virtual organization uh, were securities and therefore were subject to federal securities laws. The report confirms that issuers of distributed ledger or blockchain technology-based securities must register offers and sales of such securities unless a valid exemption applies. Those participating in unregistered offerings also may be liable for violations of the securities laws. Additionally, securities exchanges providing for trading in these securities must register unless they are exempt. The purpose of the registration provisions of the federal securities laws is to ensure that investors are sold investments that include all the proper disclosures and are subject to regulatory scrutiny for investors' protection. I want to really touch on that last part, where they say that the purpose of uh, an entity or what have you to register uh, with the Securities and Exchange Commission is to, number one, uh, protect the consumers and make sure that the DAO is properly disclosing what they're going to be investing in. And number two, just in case they aren't or for whatever other reason, they want to make sure that, you know, the SEC in this case, they want to make sure that the government can step in and protect customers if they feel like they need to. So obviously, if you are familiar with the crypto space, this goes entirely against <laughs> what the actual mantra is, which, is going, which again is going to be decentralization, permissionlessness, and really just not having a third party intermediary able to step in and stop anything. Uh, obviously, there are goods and bad parts to that, but that isn't the only thing uh, that they kind of talked about here. I really wanted to point out something very important here, too. Uh, innovation is not protected. Quote, the innovative technology behind these virtual transactions does not exempt securities offerings and trading platforms from the regulatory framework designed to protect investors and the integrity of the markets, says Stephanie uh, Avakian, co-director of the SEC's Enforcement Division. As you can clearly see, and mind you, this was about four years ago, so maybe their stance has changed, they don't really care whether you're innovating or creating new technology or not. They just want to make sure that the, the people are okay, which I understand. But I think it gets to a certain point where you do a little bit more harm than good, and I mean really in the long term. Um, obviously, in this case, uh, the, the SEC actually didn't even end up doing anything. This was really just an investigation. Because actually what ended up happening was how uh, the DAO was actually hacked for roughly 14% of the entire supply of Ether at the time. And this is what actually caused the fork uh, between Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And again, the crazy part about this is that no one was even sued. I quote, In light of the facts and circumstances, the agency has decided not to bring charges in this instance or make findings of violations in the report but rather to caution the industry and market participants. The federal securities laws apply to those who offer and sell securities in the United States, regardless whether the issuing entity is a traditional company or a decentralized autonomous organization. They don't care if you're a person, if you're a robot, if you're a smart contract, they want you registering, brother. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, and I, I get that. I, I definitely understand. I mean, the, the, my thing is, again, you know, obviously I'm not saying that because just because you're innovating, you have the right to scam people, um, right? It's more along the lines of maybe working with such organizations, you know, the, obviously the people behind them, right? To come to a solution and maybe an even ground between innovation and protection because you can only protect people so much, right? People will do whatever they want at the end of the day. It's their money. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you can't almost, you can't really baby them and you can't stop innovation from happening. This is the United States. I mean, shit, don't we pride ourselves in innovation? Just saying. The next one we're going to touch on is Ripple Labs. Before we get into that, I just want to go ahead and shout out DJ Khaled and Floyd Mayweather uh, for promoting some ICOs on here. Uh, it's okay, though. We're not really going to talk about them today. <laughs> so what happened with Ripple Labs? I mean, this is one of the biggest cases right now. Uh, if, you're in, if you're in the crypto space, you know exactly what's going on with this. But essentially, why are they being sued? Number one, they sold XRP, which is their cryptocurrency, uh, in exchange for US dollars, dating all the way back to 2013. Number two, XRP was given in exchange for labor or market making services, and in this case, this can include, um, you know, this can include bounties where you know you go ahead and pay people in XRP for promoting your coin, uh, and then market making services is stuff like you're pretty much um, allowing there to be liquidity on exchanges. So it's pretty much like hiring a company to trade your coin back and forth, uh, which may sound kind of dumb, but it, it's good in terms of keeping a liquid market. Uh, and number two, or sorry, number three, uh, Larson and Garlinghouse, co-founder and ex-CEO of uh, Ripple Labs, personally sold $600 million worth of XRP coins. Oh, uh, God, that's, hor that's horrible. So in total, they ended up raising right around $1.3 billion. Now, what was the outcome of this? Well, because this is an ongoing case, uh, there really is no outcome quite yet. Uh, and frankly, if these guys are able to come out of this scot-free, it, it's going to be huge for the entire crypto space. I mean, it's literally going to change 
how cryptocurrencies are viewed in terms of securities and all that stuff. And the most notable part about this lawsuit is actually like more of why they ended up suing them in the first place, um, stating that they should have registered because, quote, the registration requirements are designed to ensure that potential investors, including, importantly, retail investors, receive important information about an issuer's business operations and financial condition, says Mark P. Berger, Deputy Director of the SEC's Enforcement Division. Here, we allege that Ripple and its executives failed over a period of years to satisfy these core investor protection provisions, and as a result, investors lacked information to which they were entitled. Now, this is something very interesting to me. Uh, obviously, in this case, they don't really say, I guess, entirely the reason that they're suing them is because they failed to inform customers of what they were doing, but it's, they almost make it sound that way, whereas, let's say Ripple were just, were you know, this entire time to be completely transparent with its holders and say, hey, we're selling XYZ amount of coins to facilitate whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and, you know, go ahead and tell them more important information that the SEC is claiming that they held. Uh, would they have not been sued? Because they were still selling uh, XRP, which would have counted as a sale, sale of securities that was not registered. Uh, this is just something that I find very interesting. And again, something very notable because this is one of the biggest cases right now within the crypto space because XRP is such an enormous coin, but it does show you that the SEC does hold its core values in this case, uh, making sure the consumer is you know, cognizant of what the actual company that they're investing in is telling them uh, is still relative to this day. However, we're going to go on to the most recent lawsuit now by the SEC, and that's going to be Library. So if you're not familiar, Library is essentially a platform, a video content creation platform, much like YouTube, uh, but it's a lot more decentralized in nature. It operates on a blockchain uh, and pretty much touts itself as more of a freedom of speech type platform, uh, not really politically aligned in any way, just the idea that you should be able to say whatever you want because we are in a place that values freedom of speech. So let's go ahead and talk about why the SEC sued Library. Well, according to the SEC's complaint, from at least July 2016 to February 2021, Library, which offers a video sharing application, sold a digital asset securities called the Library Credits to numerous investors, including investors, based in the, including investors based in the U.S. The complaint alleges that Library did not follow a registration statement for the offering and that the offering failed to satisfy any exemption from registration. The complaint further alleges that by failing to file a registration statement, Library denied prospective investors the information required for such an offering to the public. As alleged, Library received more than $11 million in US dollars, Bitcoin, and services from purchasers who participated in its offering. So taking a look at why the SEC sued Library, we can kind of come to more or less of a conclusion that the SEC doesn't like the idea that people can go ahead and buy cryptos without necessarily having to do any research. It's hard for, to, put, to put blame on uh, projects like these that need the capital raised to continue to innovate on such important technology that maybe doesn't matter today, but is going to matter at some point in the future. In this case, they say that by failing to file a registration statement, Library denied investors the information required for an offering to the public. So they're saying that because they didn't file, people didn't have the information available to them, which I think is complete, you know, bull. <laughs> I mean, you can look up the information yourself before you buy a coin, before you buy a token, just like you would any other investment. Um, and it's quite clear the library is far from any type of meme or shitcoin that we've seen uh, kind of blowing up in the past month or so. So to allege that they withheld information from the consumer just because they didn't file is, I don't know, it's quite disingenuous to me. And to be honest with you, I think this lawsuit... Uh, it, a lot of people are kind of saying that this lawsuit is, is in an effort to protect Google, or YouTube in this case, a uh, shout out to YouTube, <laughs> um, because Library was actually taking quite a big, I mean, I, wanna, I don't want to say a hefty amount of market share from, you, from YouTube, but they were getting quite a good amount of people on their platform, uh, which is now called Odyssey. And something notable to talk about in terms of what the SEC is trying to get out of this is that they're really not trying to get rid of the Library platform and the blockchain, but it really just seems like they're trying to get some money out of Library Inc.'s pockets. Uh, again, which is going to be the company behind the development of the library protocol. Now, obviously, we should go ahead and remind ourselves that the SEC doesn't deem uh, innovation as an excuse uh, for the breaking of the securities laws. But the SEC does know that if you let one case slide that does somehow allow the sales of maybe alleged securities, then any future case can refer back to that case 
and pretty much allow any project to sell cryptocurrencies without fear of any litigation within the US. But now that we're up to date with what's going on with the SEC, by the way, there are a lot more cases than just the ones that we talked about today, uh, but it's really important that we know just kind of where the SEC is standing in terms of their lawsuits. But I really kind of want to touch on this last part, which is we're kind of comparing uh, what happened before the Great Depression um, and now. So we know that the SEC was made to protect the consumer from fraudulent activity, uh, obviously within the market, whether it be due to unscrupulous activities uh, by companies offering securities or financial institutions not giving you the full story when trying to get you to invest. However, as the crypto space becomes more and more widespread and irrelevant in today's society, it has also become more and more complicated, both in how people are able to make their own cryptos, as well as how people are able to interact with blockchains with their crypto without any intermediary or regulator to stop them. Because of this adoption and innovation, we've seen a huge wave of new investors enter the crypto markets and just chuck money at anything that resembles signs of mooning, including but not limited to Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, SafeMoon, any of those coins. Uh, coins that don't necessarily do anything, uh, but causing prices to skyrocket overnight as well as dump the next day. Not to mention, it's very easy for new investors to gain access to leverage trading or trading on margin by using a decentralized application on Ethereum or even some of the sketchier exchanges that exist out there. But let me ask you, did any of what I just said remind you of something? Did somebody say uh, the Great Depression? As I mentioned, this is pretty much like a carbon copy of what happened back in the 20s. People were throwing money that they could not afford to lose into booming markets that they didn't completely understand. And of course, as a result, lost a lot from it. Uh, however, there is one major difference between the 20s and now, and that's education. Nowadays, we have computers, libraries, videos, articles, all these things that contain help and guides to navigating the cryptocurrency space and showing you how to manage your risk. Granted, there are quite a bit of sources out there that could care less and only talk about what coin is mooning next and telling you what to jump on. But the fact of the matter remains that there are guides out there that help you learn more about cryptos and pretty much I would say a good amount of people do take advantage of them. I mean, there are quite a lot of people getting into this space now that are quite knowledgeable. But if you compare it to back then, the public literally had to go strictly off what the financial institutions were telling them, um, pretty much what they were telling them to buy into. And obviously we know that you couldn't trust them anyways because they were just trying to make money off you too. And that's why I'm saying education is so important because we have so much of it. It boggles my mind when I see people just throwing money into something without knowing about it. Obviously, people are a lot more busier nowadays. They have more things uh, kind of taking up their time and their mental space. But you think that something you're throwing your life savings into uh, would be quite important for you to look into right? Most people get burned and lose money in these markets because they lack education and don't care to get it. FOMO is obviously a big factor in people throwing their life savings at this stuff, but it's up to the investor at the end of the day to handle their hard-earned money with responsibility. If you always give the investor, the average investor, a way to kind of, uh, you know, slide out of responsibility uh, for their actions, and they'll never really learn how to make an educated decision. Now, if the SEC focused on education more so than enforcing laws on companies that are trying to innovate or maybe even potentially scam, does this mean that more people will get burned in the short term? Yeah, probably. But the thing is that it teaches people at the end of the day by experience. Don't mess around in markets or things that you don't understand unless you want to get burned. By allowing the SEC to regulate these markets to all hell, all they do is protect the investor short term and they're pretty much giving them an excuse as to why they lost money and allowing them to blame it on someone else. If an individual doesn't understand why they lost money in the first place and relies on the government to save them every time, people won't learn and more and more scams will continue to pop up. And the thing is, is that there's no way to stop people from scamming and making fraudulent projects other than incentivizing them not to. People won't bother scamming other people if those newbies don't fall for it in the first place. So although it may seem like the harder thing to do in the short term, the SEC should focus more of their efforts on educating rather than enforcing. Because in my opinion, education in the short term will lead to a lot less enforcement in the long term. You won't need to enforce anything if there are no projects that are doing anything fraudulent in the first place. And then of course by doing this, you know, you're giving the average investor the power to make their own smart decisions on where they put their money, and it also encourages projects to prosper by raising capital to continue to innovate within this space, and of course within the United States in general. Now, shout out to the SEC, I don't think they're going to like this part, but crypto projects at the end of the day will continue to raise capital for their projects, whether the government likes it or not. Because of the decentralized and permissionless nature of the space, there's very little that the SEC or the government in general can do besides threaten people within the U.S. with jail time. Uh, all this does really is incentivize people to move away from the U.S. to different countries where the crypto regulations are a lot more friendly. And shout-outs to New York, man. We got, we got it the worst over here. <laughs>
I think a good example of analyzing this space for what it is and taking the innovation as well as the enforcement, you know, into consideration is uh, the crypto mom. I'm not going to lie to you. I don't have her name. I'll put it on the screen over here. Uh, however, I watched her interview on Bankless, uh, some dudes over here that talk about Ethereum and pretty much anything DeFi related in this space. And she is pretty much the embodiment of what regulation or government should look like. It shouldn't, when we think of the government, when we think of the SEC, we should not think of, you know, right away of uh, regulation, enforcement, uh, you know, litigation. We should think of this entity that is trying to help us. We should think of, I mean, we say big brother a lot, but yeah, we should think of the SEC as our big brother. Someone that's there, you know, not only um, uh, protecting us, right, in terms of, our investments and all that stuff, but helping us to make the right decision. A good brother, and I just, I'm, a, I'm a twin brother, a good brother allows the other one to learn by experience and by pretty much teaching them, not by trying to block them every step of the way whenever they try to branch out and do something new. Uh, it's, it's kind of funny and crazy how that kind of relates, right? But nonetheless, she's a great person to look at in terms of innovation and open-mindedness. Really just willing to have that conversation with people is kind of the most important thing in my opinion. Uh, and I will say that I've been very critical of the SEC in the past, uh, but I do understand that at the end of the day, all they're trying to do is protect the everyday investor, which just so happens to know nothing about crypto and is jumping into the space and throwing tons of money at the first shitcoin that they see. But at the same time, they have to realize that the reach is very limited and, is, and isn't going to help anyone in the long term. There are people losing thousands, millions of dollars every week from rug pulls and scams and nothing is being done about it. The way you fix it is to prevent it from happening in the first place, which is through education. People want to throw their money into something they know is a scam. And if they do, and sayonara, brother. I have no idea why you're doing that. <laughs> and it is pretty crazy um, how after doing all this research, it really just reminds me of how reminiscent all this stuff is of the 20s. And as we can kind of see right now, um, the regulation really isn't working. Although they are suing uh, quite a bit of companies, some doing the right thing, some doing the wrong thing, um, there are a lot more projects out there rug pulling, scamming, and doing all that stuff within the crypto space, and it's all going right under the SEC's eyes. So again, in my opinion, arm people with knowledge and education, and they'll go a lot farther than you think. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.